Welcome to the video, Cultivating Confidence in the Change Process, Deconstructing Negative Expectations in Personal Growth. My name is Dr. Stephen Bacon. I'm a clinical psychologist in Santa Barbara, California, and I've spent the past decade writing books and researching exactly how psychotherapy works. Thinking of the whole psyche, the last video argued that a constructionist approach gives the personal growth seeker a significant edge because they know there are no spirits. They know that they are always already free and that the limitations on their freedom are essentially constructs with no correspondence in fundamental reality. While this is true and both helpful and useful, it takes some effort to have this insight pervade every aspect of the mind. A moment of reflection reveals that only part of the psyche is under conscious control. Accomplishing change requires affecting the part influenced or dominated by the unconscious. In this sense, a central goal is to communicate the principles of constructionism from the conscious mind to the unconscious. To accomplish these goals, one needs a map of the whole person and a set of practices that allow the conscious self to guide, heal, inspire the parts of the psyche that are immersed in pain problems, trauma, challenges. While many models of the whole person are incompatible with constructionism in that they implicitly endorse the concept of spirits and exorcisms, there are several models that fit well with the freedom and fluidity that characterizes the constructionist approach. Thinking fast and slow. Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman created a holistic model of the psyche that he named Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman employed this model to summarize his research, which essentially showed that people fear loss more than they prize gains, a finding that revolutionized the field of behavioral economics. His model is quite useful for understanding a constructionist approach to personal growth, because the way that he articulates the two aspects of mind is perfectly designed for developing discernment between what is constructed and what is real between what is part of constructed reality and then by fluid and malleable and what is part of fundamental reality and therefore relatively stable and solid. System one and two. Kahneman divides the mind into two parts, system one and system two. System two is easier to describe and understand. It specializes in effortful, analytical, mathematical, logical, and rational reasoning hence thinking slow. Kahneman states, system two allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it, including complex computations. The operations of system two are often associated with the subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. This is the part of the mind that most easily understands constructionism. System one is much less rational, the first thing Kahneman says about System 1 is that it operates automatically and quickly, with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. System 1 is responsible for quick assessments of danger versus safety, friend versus enemy, desirable versus undesirable. It stores stereotypes, assumptions, associations, and snap judgments, and effortlessly overlays them on the world. System 1 and Evolution Kahneman believes that System 1 was evolved to fulfill an evolutionary purpose of keeping us safe both physically and emotionally. The physical safety is straightforward. System 1 is biased toward determining threatening versus unthreatening situations quickly and effortlessly. Kahneman presents a great deal of research showing that this threat assessment isn't rational and reasonable. Rather, System 1 is designed to overweight the threat of every situation and irrationally prioritizes the sure thing, an avoidance of pain over healthy risk-taking. Not only does System 1 keep us safe from physical dangers, it also keeps us emotionally safe and relatively free from anxiety by developing a worldview that is cohesive and predictable. Kahneman describes the worldview creation aspect of System 1 as follows. The main function of System 1 is to maintain and update a model of your personal world 
which represents what is normal in it. The model is constructed by associations that link ideas of circumstances, events, actions, and outcomes that co-occur with some regularity, either at the same time or within a relatively short interval. As these links are formed and strengthened, the pattern of associated ideas comes to represent the structure of events in your life and determines your interpretation of the present as well as your expectations of the future. Kahneman and Worldview Kahneman has essentially designated System 1 as the worldview creator and maintainer. This part of the psyche, the part that prioritizes structuring meaning, is naturally the primary focus for constructionism. For personal growth seekers, this part of the mind is both the greatest prison warden as well as, potentially, the greatest asset. Kahneman argues that this worldview function is every bit as important as the risk-avoiding function. Human beings become paralyzed and terrified when directly exposed to chaos and unpredictability. The sense that anything can happen creates profound anxiety in most people. The belief that the world is unordered and unpredictable can even create paralysis and a fugue state. It is something to be avoided at all costs. Kahneman comments, The sense-making machinery of System 1 makes us see the world as more tidy, simple, predictable, and coherent than it really is. The illusion that one has understood the past feeds the further illusion that one can predict and control the future. These illusions are comforting. They reduce the anxiety that we would experience if we allowed ourselves to fully acknowledge the uncertainties of existence. We all have a need for the reassuring message that actions have appropriate consequences, that success will reward wisdom and courage. Kahneman and Apollonian Forces With his description of System 1, Kahneman has done an almost perfect job of defining the home base of the Apollonian forces. System 1 operates via feelings, not by rationality, and its primary motivation is the awareness and avoidance of danger. It uses black and white thinking. Everything it perceives seems solid, and everything is evaluated in terms of its potential threat. There is no sense of constructed reality. Everything is part of fundamental reality. Essentially, it promotes a fear-based life. It not only sees the outer world that way, it has a similar approach to self-image. System 1 catalogs mistakes and emphasizes them much more than successes. To avoid mistakes, it frequently reminds us of our problems and weak points. Moreover, it relentlessly applies guilt and shame to minimize the chance that we will ever do anything wrong again. The fact that this results in a person who is fear-based, who misses many opportunities for joy and success, and who lives a relatively small life, is of no concern to System 1. At least we're alive, might be the rejoinder. Choices and the Unconscious Kahneman tells us that System 1 is stronger than System 2. In fact, he argues that most choices and decisions come from System 1, and that System 2 is primarily used to justify System 1. In this sense, it's a waste of time to try and talk a political opponent out of their convictions through logic. Their convictions come from System 1 and are tightly linked to their worldview. People often act as if their convictions are derived from logic, from System 2, but Kahneman's research rebuts this idea. Kahneman is a cognitive psychologist, and he and his colleagues are loath to use the concept of the unconscious mind because it is so hard to define and measure. That said, it is a small leap to move from what Kahneman calls associations and links to what others call unconscious influences. In other words, System 1 is an apparently conscious part of the mind, but it lies at the intersection of consciousness and the unconscious. Remember that Kahneman says that System 1 operates automatically and quickly, with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. Put another way, whatever old traumas and feelings of fear lie in the unconscious, subtly but powerfully contribute to System 1's efforts to avoid risk. Psychological Applications Kahneman's model and his analyses make it clear how much work one needs to do to enjoy the full benefits of constructionism. The last video invited us to enjoy a state of freedom and fluidity. We can see that our explanations are constructed, our cures are rituals, and therefore 
our inner stance toward our suffering are equally constructed. All well and good. However, when we attempt to apply these insights pragmatically and psychologically, they immediately run into resistance from System 1. The first level of resistance is feeling. To System 1, which believes that there is only fundamental reality, it just feels wrong to argue that three different therapists would come up with three different explanations for my panic disorder. To the concrete thinking System 1, one of the explanations is true and two are wrong. Or with a bit more justification, perhaps all of the explanations have common elements, and therefore they all participate in an underlying truth. System 1 can't handle the idea that the explanations are no more true than spirit possession, and that the experts are as confused as the clients. Accepting these kinds of relativistic, nuanced ideas makes System 1 feel that the world is unpredictable. If you're adventurous, such feeling can be exhilarating. If you're System 1 and fear-based, then unpredictable equals danger, threat, and potential disaster. Deconstruction and Deprogramming The rest of this video is about how to influence System 1 in a positive direction. More specifically, it is an attempt to help System 1 embrace the principles of constructionism. With enough work, System 1 can move from fear-based to adventurous, from avoidance to engagement, and from concrete thinking to the fluidity of constructionism. There are many ways to influence System 1. One can use practices like meditation or body work or membership in communities that encourage personal growth. That said, arguably the royal road to transforming System 1 is mindfulness and deprogramming, examining areas in the personal growth literature that implicitly support Apollonian paradigms and deconstructing them. That's what we have already done with the outcome literature, standard psychological explanations, and psychotherapeutic techniques. The more we work to deprogram related ideas, the more System 1 will gain the capacity to support the constructionist ideas of freedom, fluidity, and malleability, the sense that psychological reality can be changed by a word, a gesture, or a thought. Getting specific. Let's begin to practice deconstruction by looking at the concept of the five love languages. Are there really five? Or actually, are there 13 or nine? It's obviously determined by the writer, not by reality. And who can say that each person prefers only one? It's probably more accurate that they prefer different ones in different moods, or different ones with different people. All the book is actually saying is, you ought to learn what pleases your lover and respond accordingly. Of course, reading the book helps many people. It can motivate people to pay attention to their own and others' needs and creates a sense of being conscious about underlying human processes. Anything that enhances this kind of attention is positive. How can such things harm a constructionist perspective? The problem is that the concept of five love languages implicitly undergirds the Apollonian assumption that relationships are operating in fundamental reality. In fundamental reality, there is a formula for everything, how to bake a cake or how to make steel. But in constructive reality, things change with a thought or a word. The idea that there is a recipe for relationships, figure out your partner's love language, and give them that kind of attention, and things will go well, reifies the relationship. In the long run, these kinds of Apollonian assumptions do more harm than good. Parent skills training. The five love language discussion leads directly into one of the most common psychotherapy and personal growth interventions, skills trainings. Take parent skills training as an example. Parent training is quite effective, but not because of the skills one learns. The culture already teaches members the basics of parenting. Love your children, model good values, set healthy limits, listen to children and see them as unique individuals, etc. Parent skills trainings involve elaborations on these basic, already known concepts. The improvement in behavior arises because of the group process. Participants are motivated to use the skills they already know because they have committed to the group and to improving as parents. They know they will be sharing at the next group meeting and they want the approval of the group. Of course, certain participants literally learn some new skills. They express gratitude and attribute progress in parenting to these new skills. 
but one can easily analyze these attributions using some imaginary exercises. For the first exercise, imagine that at the first session of the parenting skills class, you decide to recreate the parenting skills curriculum with the whiteboard exercise. Take 45 minutes and via a series of questions about good parenting, draw out everything your group already knows about boundaries, reinforcements, limits, unconditional love, etc. At the end of the 45 minutes, you would realize that your whiteboard record of the conversation includes the complete curriculum of every manual that's ever been written about parenting skills. In short, the group already had skills before they were taught them. Deconstructing skills training. For the next exercise, take a group of people who score very high in parenting skills. For example, therapists. Now imagine comparing the outcomes of their children to other children in the same social class. If the skills are important, the therapist children should clearly outshine the rest. Of course, we know they won't. Similarly, are all therapists' marriages better because the therapist is excellent at communication skills? Are all therapists' divorces better because therapists know conflict resolution skills? If the skills were actually innately powerful, everyone would want to be a therapist since therapists allegedly know secret, powerful, healing life skills that guarantee that they and their families will have better lives. The final and most convincing point is that if therapists and workshop leaders really know innately powerful skills that regular people don't know, then they would have techniques with inherent power. However, we know from the research that psychotherapy has no techniques with inherent power. Misrepresenting skills trainings. These critiques are not simply for parent skills training. The whiteboard exercise can recreate the curriculums for anger management groups, assertiveness training, coping skills training, divorce recovery groups, and so on. Of course, certain members in every group won't know every skill, but they almost certainly know an alternative skill that they can use if they are motivated. Every member of an anger management group, when motivated, knows four or five skills to control their anger. Teaching them eight or ten doesn't make the difference. It's motivating them to use what they already know. Again, why is it important to deconstruct the idea of skills training? Because just like the five love languages, recipes for success are characteristic of fundamental reality. When the spirits aren't real, your apparent lack of parenting skills isn't real either. Just like the exorcism client who focuses on change without being distracted by spirits, the parent that looks at the parent-child problem without being distracted by the concept of skills deficits will arrive more rapidly at an answer. The final reason is that these representations simply aren't true. The idea that there are five love languages is literally false. Similarly, the implied principle in skills training is that our problems occur because of lack of skills and are remediated with new skills. That's just not how it works. The basic instructions. The five love languages, skills training, and much of the personal growth literature takes many of their main principles from what might be called common wisdom, or perhaps the basic instructions. Constructionism teaches that every culture socializes each member into a view of reality. We are all taught how to understand shared concepts and how to recognize who is a cultural member and who isn't. As part of this acculturation, we are taught basic instructions, common wisdom. These are principles of living that are designed to increase one's health and vitality, instill pro-social and productive social strategies, and cope with stress. The concept of these basic instructions was popularized by a 1986 book by Robert Fulham entitled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. As many people might remember, this book pointed out that virtually all of the basic instructions are in place by kindergarten although a number of them need to be updated as one moves through the various life stages. Kindergarten lessons. Some of these instructions are physical, like eat right, sleep right, and exercise right. Others are connected to more social behaviors and life strategies. For example, when a coworker tells us, you're always getting so defensive when anyone gives you feedback, you might want to think about that. He's reiterating a kindergarten lesson. Ditto for someone who encourages us to take healthy risks or be more vulnerable in relationships or more generally responsible in our life. Obviously, some of these instructions need to be adjusted 
depending on what part of the culture you inhabit. In this sense, many people write articles critical of certain parts of common wisdom and urging us to update certain instructions. This is where concepts like sexism, racism, ageism, and so on become central. Just as obviously these basic instructions are constructed and vary depending on what part of the subculture you might inhabit. For example, the basic instructions taught in a California liberal family would vary significantly from the ones taught in a Mississippi Baptist family. And clearly, the basic instructions in a Native American setting in the 1600s would be radically different. Basic Instructions and Relative Reality A number of constructionists have used the metaphor that life can be like playing a game. When we all agree to play a certain game, we also agree that we will let certain rules define game reality. For example, in baseball, we all agree what is inbounds and what is a foul, what is a strike and what is a ball. Outside of baseball, these ideas are not real. They are seen as constructs. Inside the game, they can be treated like terms that define reality. Basic instructions are similar. In the game of Western culture, we have rules about authority, deference, sexiness, teamwork, and many other concepts. They are certainly not real from the view of another culture. They may be in serious dispute by certain subgroups in our own culture, but they are basic instructions because they outline feelings and behaviors that purport to lead to success and happiness. And when we violate them, our friends and acquaintances may feel obliged or allowed to tell us that we ought to behave better. The good news is that this feedback is often useful. The bad news is that it may be full of prejudice, privilege, and unconscious assumptions. Psychotherapy is about the basic instructions. Jerome Frank defined psychotherapy as the provision of an explanation which leads to a healing prescription, which results in improvement or cure. We have already shown that this process is almost completely constructed. That said, most of what happens in psychotherapy is highly influenced by the basic instructions. First wave CBT is almost entirely about the basic instructions. Reality therapy is 100% about basic instructions. The practical part of most substance abuse treatment is basic instructions. And the working through aspect of psychodynamic psychotherapy also leans heavily on basic instructions. The research results already foreshadowed this conclusion. Why can beginners equal the experienced therapist? Because both of the groups know the basic instructions, and therapy is mostly about applying the basic instructions. Why do therapists not improve with experience? Well, it's partly because they aren't focused on the actual mechanisms of change. However, the other reason is that they had already mastered the basic instructions as beginners, and that mastery has little room to grow. Ease of change. The reason for showing that much of psychotherapy is simply the basic instructions in disguise is to deconstruct psychotherapy. If psychotherapy is a highly refined skill and we need it to resolve our problems, then our problems must be daunting and frightening. The fact that beginners equal experts because they are all using tools they learned in kindergarten should be reassuring to personal growth seekers. If the psychotherapy process, which is misrepresented as highly evolved, works mostly using basic instructions, then fixing my problem shouldn't be so hard. I've grown fond of saying that the core of psychotherapy is simply one person asking another to change. Of course, the therapist and client have to make up an explanation and a healing ritual that gives the client permission to change. And it helps if the healer has high status and is credible and respected. But that's pretty much it. Once we recognize the truth of this simple idea, then our fear of change goes away. When that fear is gone or substantially reduced, our ability to change becomes much easier. The Utility of Cringing Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a novel called Nausea, where his character experienced nausea as a result of encountering the confusion between existence and essence. Put in constructionist language, he experienced nausea as he observed how humans construct their experience and impose essential qualities on the thing in itself. If we want to deprogram System 1, we need to be able to cringe inwardly when we hear about the five love languages, or parent skills training, or that alcohol problems require sobriety. One needs to cringe not because these approaches are ineffective, 
Remember that the research clearly documents that every credible approach works for some people. But because they each have a way to influence one, or even bewitch one, into seeing constructed reality as fundamental reality. Each moment of cringing partly realigns System 1. It allows one to see our own pain and problems more fluidly and creates a healthy foundation for personal interventions. As we know, my System 1 is repeatedly influenced by Apollonian assumptions of those around me. Deconstruction and cringing are not one-time processes. Rather, they are something that needs to be cultivated as a practice. Wisdom flows downhill. Constructionism's contribution to personal growth is all about creating a mindset for success and facilitating ease of change. Apollonians always argue for stability. They typically see change and growth as hard, slow, challenging, and sometimes impossible. Conversely, constructionists recognize that the actual way that change operates in Western culture implies that change is much easier than commonly thought. Moreover, it appears that the greatest obstacle to change is our assumptions that our problems are solid and substantial. System 2 has a relatively easy time embracing a constructionist approach. This video introduced the more complex issues around System 1 and outlined some important ways to introduce it to fluidity and Dionysian principles. In that sense, constructionist freedom begins in System 2 and moves down to System 1 through thought, analysis, observation, and cringing. Nasruddin. Nasruddin is a Persian trickster figure whose exploits serve as Sufi teaching stories. Nasruddin was walking past a well. When he had the impulse to look into it, it was night, and as he peered into the deep water, he saw the moon's reflection there. I must save the moon, the mullah thought, otherwise she will never wane, and the fasting month of Ramadan will never come to an end. He found a rope, threw it in, and called down, Hold tight, keep bright, Sakura is at hand. The rope caught on a rock inside the well, and Nasruddin heaved as hard as he could. Straining back, he suddenly felt the rope give as it came loose, and he was thrown on his back. As he lay there panting, he saw the moon riding in the sky above. Glad to be of service, said Nasruddin. Just as well I came along, wasn't it? In this story, Nasruddin plays the role of the psychotherapist, the professional helper who is sure the change comes because of their effort. Recognizing the futility of their perspective allows the constructionists to facilitate their own personal growth.